Howdy. Hey. Any secrets you want to tell us? <laughs> oh, that got me two and a half years in prison. I should probably keep my mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> What's life like as a spy? Oh, Jared, it was so much fun. I miss it very much, actually. <laughs> Got to see the world, 65 countries, recruited nine spies over the years to work for us. It was fun. Well, let's get this part of this story out of the way. You were actually my high school teacher. <laughs> I was indeed. I was American government and American history. I do remember you because every once in a while, there's a teacher who stands out, who actually, for some reason or another, gets you to pay attention, to listen. So thank uh, you for that. Thank you, that's very kind of you. It's insane, man. This is a pretty weird world to go from high school teacher to international spy. You know, Jared, life takes these very odd twists and turns. You just never know what's in store for you. That last semester that I had you in class, I went to see the professor, and he said, listen, I ought to tell you, I'm not really a professor here. I'm actually undercover as a professor. I'm a senior CIA officer. Would you be interested in joining the CIA? And I said, sure. Hadn't really thought of it, but I was getting married soon after graduation. I had no job, and I thought, well, this sounds like fun. So. Next thing I know, a few months later, I was in the CIA. When I first arrived, somebody met me at the front gate and they took me into an auditorium with about 30 other people and I raised my right hand and I swore to uphold the Constitution. I didn't swear to, to you know, keep the agency's uh, crimes a secret, but I swore to uphold the Constitution and, and I meant it. And they put me to work on Iraq and they said the reason I was being assigned to Iraq was that nothing ever happened there. So I had been there about nine months, and just as I begin to feel like I really know what I'm talking about, Iraq invades Kuwait. So next thing I know, I'm, I'm going to the White House and briefing the president and taking a call at my desk from Colin Powell when he was the national security advisor. And then I went into Kuwait City with the Marines on Liberation Day, March 1st, 1991. I went through the whole traditional clandestine operations training. Guns, explosives, counterterrorism driving, jumping out of an airplane, swimming through a swamp to, you know, make a dead drop on an island. You're all covered with leeches. You have to fight the cotton mouths that are swimming across the, the bog. It was, it was rough. But one thing that I was really, really good at was convincing people to commit treason. Now, oftentimes, they'll want money, but a lot of times it's not about the money. They want their children to go to an American university. One guy wanted a new Vespa. I mean, he was willing to commit treason for me, espionage, in exchange for a Vespa. One guy did it just because he loved the United States. So what happened after that? In the summer of 2000, there was an attempt on my life in Athens. There was a terrorist group there. They planned to kill me on the way to work one day, but they saw that I was in an armored car and they knew from earlier surveillance that I was carrying a weapon. And so instead they killed my next door neighbor, a Stephen Saunders, who was the British defense attache. So I was deemed to be a little bit too hot, meaning too many um, of our enemies knew my true identity. And so I was pulled back from the Middle East and then September 11th hit. It was in Pakistan as the chief of counterterrorism operations that I led what became the biggest counterterrorism raid in CIA's history. We captured Abu Zubaydah, who we believed at the time was the number three in Al Qaeda. We picked him up and we threw him into the back of a filthy Toyota pickup truck. And then he went to what ended up being the first 
CIA secret prison. Where is he now? He's in Guantanamo now. He's been in CIA custody for almost 14 years now. He's not been charged with a crime, I'll add. What are they waiting for? They can't legally charge him with a crime because everything that he ever told the CIA was as a result of torture. They began with the most entry level of the torture techniques. They would grab him by the lapels and shove him up against a plywood wall. And all that stuff is humiliating, but it's not painful in any way. But then things get very serious very quickly after that. Abu Zubaydah, for example, had an irrational fear of cockroaches. And so they would keep him in a dog cage and they would fill the cage with cockroaches just to make him insane. They ended up waterboarding him 83 times. And even after 83 times, uh, he gave up no actionable intelligence. He saved no American lives. He disrupted no attacks against the United States. The torture just simply doesn't work. And so it was, it was a crime with no outcome that you can show the American people actually helped anybody. There were techniques too, Jared, that I, that I thought were worse than waterboarding. There was something called the cold cell, where we strip a prisoner naked, you chain him to an eye bolt in the ceiling so his arms are up and he can't get comfortable. He can't kneel or sit or lay down. His cell is chilled to 50 degrees, and every hour somebody goes in and throws ice water on him. That's illegal. Okay, we killed three people using that technique, but no one was ever charged with a crime. I mean, the investigation found that, ah, yep, he died. Well, sorry, too bad. It was an accident. We can't lose who we are as Americans in the name of counterterrorism. You know, we have civil liberties in this country and I want my September 10th country back. I left the CIA in 2004. I went into the private sector and I kept my mouth shut for five and a half years. And in 2007, I got a call from Brian Ross at ABC News. So I went down to the ABC News studio in Washington. Brian Ross flew in from New York. And I said three things in that interview that utterly changed the course of the rest of my life. I said the CIA was torturing its prisoners. I said that torture was official US government policy. And I said the policy was approved by and signed by the President of the United States. The CIA was very angry with me for airing the dirty laundry. And so they asked the Justice Department to, uh, to charge me. In January of 2012, I was charged with three counts of espionage for the ABC News interview. Now, the, the point really was not to find me guilty. The point was to make an example of me to deter other whistleblowers from coming forward. And the Justice Department really has this down to a science. They know that your attorneys are very expensive. I had 11 attorneys, but I was looking at 45 years in prison. I said, I'm not doing 45 minutes. I'm gonna fight this, I don't care what it costs. That's not really what your defense attorneys wanna hear. And you know, we got up over a million bucks and they said, look, I think we should investigate the idea of a plea. And they said, well, what do you want us to offer them? I said, tell them I'll do a year and a day. A year and a day would make me eligible for early release at 10 and a half months. So we offered a year and a day and they came back with three years. We went with two, they said two and a half, and they said it's our final offer. So what do you do? I have five kids at home. Do you roll the dice knowing that the government wins 98.2% of its cases according to ProPublica? I couldn't take that chance, so I took the deal. And then uh, just a couple of months later, my attorneys drove me up to prison and dropped me off. Anything that keeps you up at night? I'm not sure that we can trust our government. Everything that the CIA has told us since 2001 has been a lie, and it doesn't matter who's in the White House. In August of this year, 2015, the White House killed 424 people in August. Uh, these are people who've never been charged with a crime. They've never faced their accusers in court. 
They've never had their day to explain themselves. We're just supposed to take the CIA's word for it that, that these are bad people. But then we have these independent voices, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the International Committee of the Red Cross saying, wait a minute, 90% of these people are innocent civilians who just happen to be near the site of these drone attacks. One of my attorneys is representing a drone whistleblower right now. And he told me recently that he was operating his drone from a basin, I think it was Nevada or New Mexico. He's connected by radio and the guy in CENTCOM says, you see the target? Launch. And the guy said, I can't launch, there's a child next to him. And the guy at CENTCOM said, it's not a child, it's a goat. And he said, man, I'm looking at it, it's a child. And he told him, launch. But the guy said, and I couldn't launch that thing, and he didn't. Well, now he's facing court martial and possibly other charges, including a dishonorable discharge for refusing to kill a child. I mean, is this really where we want our country to be? Have we so turned our backs on civil liberties since September 11th in the name of national security? It was a child. We're Americans, we're better than that. And it's not too late to turn this thing around. Ed Snowden opened so many doors for people around the world to discuss these issues. That courage is just so rare and so special. He risked everything. And because he did it in such a public fashion, the big guns were pulled out against him. And I told him, don't come home. I said, you won't get a fair trial in the Eastern District of Virginia. Your jury will be made up of people from the CIA, FBI, DOD, Homeland Security, and every intelligence and defense contractor in Washington. I said, don't come home. Not until the American people come to their senses and realize what a national service you've provided. What's the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario is that the courts uphold the ability of NSA to keep spying on American citizens, and that NSA continues to build facilities like the new one they have in Utah that has enough storage space to record and hold every telephone call, text message, and email from every American citizen for the next 500 years. And that the American people don't realize what we're losing here in terms of our civil liberties. You know, there, there are no demonstrations in the street, and I just don't understand why that is. So the worst case scenario really is that the American people don't come to their senses in time to save the country.